Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by river by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, in all that they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of God for everyone. Thanks be to God. And may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Yesterday morning, before I drove up to Andover, uh, New Hampshire, for a parade and, and to watch uh, my son uh, and his girlfriend uh, finish up a race that they were running, the, I was thinking what a, uh, we really were celebrating uh, a day that has uh, a momentous day, really, when we think about 239 years ago when the Declaration of Independence was signed and people began that process of us becoming an independent nation and that uh, it, and in our parades, which maybe you had a chance to go to parades, you know, some of that is highlighted for us. But, but I, I, uh, uh, it was interesting. My son went to another parade, not the one that ran, but a, uh, uh, another side. And he said there were all kinds of politicians there and everybody. I said there was not one politician at this, uh, or that if they were there, there were no, you know, uh, no signs of it. Which was rare, and I, and it was kind of nice. <laughs> and uh, but you know, you had the police uh, present, you had the fire department, you had the antique cars, you had the children with their bicycles decorated, uh, the uh, Shriners band marching, and uh, and and on and on. But, and candy being thrown, and I managed to even get a, you know, a Tootsie Roll, which was good. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that in our country, there's a lot of times when we read things. You know, in the fall, when our gardens produce, or in the summer, as they produce, we read. And, and we reap things as individuals in life from what we planted. We talked about planting last week. At some point, we reap that, or someone else does. And, I, and I, what I wanted to do this uh, morning, uh, a little different uh, way of presenting the message, is uh, present three situations that have happened in our country over the last uh, 10 years or so. And just snippets, if you will, of how reaping can occur. One of them is going on now by uh, what are known as custom harvesters. They're not gypsies. But they're very organized, uh, and they're families. One family, and, and, uh, uh, which was written up about a, a little while ago, had a 14-year-old son, Jacob. Every summer, with his family, he wanders south toward Texas from the Midwest, travels west across the south, and then angles northward through Colorado, Wyoming, Eastern Oregon, and Washington 
until by summer's end, they're at the Canadian border. He travels with his sister, Jill, who's 12 years old, older brother, Justin, and his mom and his dad, and hired workers. They're, they're not homeless. In fact, uh, mom and dad organize and orchestrate the, this annual pilgrimage, if you will, or work project. They're custom harvesters, and they, along with many families like them, cut the wheat for the Western farmers on a contract basis. Jacob is a pro on the combine. His brother is old enough to be able to work the elevator and haul the grain to the elevator. Jill could run the combine, but her mother needs her working in the RV and keeping stuff clean and preparing the meals for all the workers in the evening. A custom harvesting is not what most of us think about uh, when we have uh, bread or communion or when we, um, perhaps this morning, like maybe you were like me, I popped a slice of bread in the toaster and took all that good cream cheese, you know, and slathered it. And my wife can't have the cream cheese now, so uh, I have to eat it all. <laughs> it's a horrible privilege to have had a heart attack seven or ten years ago or whatever, you know. And, uh, uh, or we probably didn't think of the custom harvesters if we had pasta salad yesterday. Or having some today, but they're the ones that put that, you know, created the grain or helped to create the grain for us to have. Um, <coughs> they reap the wheat that we eat, in a sense. They're reapers. It's good work, hard work. And the Western farmers are happy to see the custom harvesters show up on their property. Uh, the, like most common harvesters, this family had their own home. Their kids go to college. They work hard. They claim rural America as a friendly place to live and to work. It's what we sing about when we sing about America the beautiful, or my country. Is a bee. These aren't dust bowl, grapes of wrath persons who struggle homeless from place to place. This is their job. This is what they do for a living. And lots of people like them, aren't there? In other walks of life, who faithfully go about, do the work, and turn up again the next day and they work constantly. They're reapers. These persons are reapers of the, harvest, of the plants that the farmers have put. But all of us, in a sense, are reapers of these reapers, <laughs> if you will. I had toast on my you know, table this morning because of persons like them. The Ecclesiastes says there's a time to reap. Think about that. And others like them this weekend. We tend to make the 4th of July celebration fireworks. In remembering the military. And I want to remember the military. Or about politicians. Or about this band. But think about the persons who you and I rub elbows with every day of the week in our work, in our shopping, in persons who contribute to our lives. Now the second thing that I would put before you a time for reaping In about 
1996-97, the family lost a little girl to a tragic illness. <coughs> and this family was tormented for nine years plus by this premature death of this girl who died in, in uh, 97. The father could never get over his anger toward God. Could not forgive God for what had happened. Uh, blaming God. Probably someone had said the will of God is what causes all to happen. I don't know. So in 2006, he took a gun he went into a one-room schoolroom <coughs> in Amish country, and he shot and killed 10 young schoolgirls at about the age that his daughter would have been. When the reporters got on this story and went to see the Amish people. They discovered something. In the midst of their anguish, in this shocking loss, the Amish community didn't cast blame. They didn't point fingers. They didn't hold a press conference with attorneys at their side. Instead, they reached out with grace and compassion to the family of the killer. That very afternoon, the grandfather of one of the little girls who was killed expressed forgiveness toward the killer, Charles Roberts. <coughs> that same day, Amish neighbors visited the Roberts family to comfort them in their sorrow and grief. And later that week, the Roberts family was invited to the funeral of one of the little girls who had been killed. And when Charles Roberts, as he had killed himself, you may remember, at his funeral, there were more Amish than non-Amish people at his service. It's ironic, writes one of the, in the newspaper article, it's ironic that the killer was tormented for nine years by the premature death of his young daughter. He never forgave God for her death. Yet after he cold bloodedly and shot ten innocent Amish girls, the Amish almost immediately forgave him and showed compassion toward his family. In a world at war, and in a society that often points fingers and blames others, their reaction was unheard of. Many reporters and interested followers of the story asked, how could they forgive such a terrible, unprovoked act of violence against innocent people? And the answer is simple, but profound. They follow the teachings of Jesus, who taught his followers to forgive one another, to place the needs of others above themselves, and to rest in the knowledge that God is still in control in this world. There were seeds that were planted within the Amish community. And when it came time to reap, and it came time in those situations where those uh, that terrible situation called up for forgiveness, they were ready for it. And they were able to do it. 
if they had not planted the seeds, as we mentioned last week, they could not have reaped forgiveness. And then more recently, again, not entirely different situation, but in Charleston, where we remember the shooting by the young man who wanted to start a class war, if you will. A friend of mine wrote this about the people in that church. How could they, to whom such monstrous, monstrous things have happened, forgive so readily, so deeply, with such reach? A man wanted to start a race war and they diverted it into an outbreak of forgiveness. How did they do this? Like the response team rushing toward the burning building, this is what they had been practicing all their lives. To love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. To be light amidst darkness. To be a fountain of mercy from the depths always. To be a fountain of mercy from the depths always and no matter what. To not have to get to a place of forgiveness because you already live there. They knew your grace, O oh God. It was all they had in their hands, all they had to give. And then he writes, God, fill me with your love. Let your mercy flow through me and help me to practice forgiveness every day, every day, every moment, so that at the time it is most needed, I too will be ready. I think of those three scenes Two which powerfully uh, express forgiveness, <coughs> but and one where the harvesters work, a constant reminder of all the work that so many people do, and how uh, reaping. happens for us not spontaneously. There is a planting and then a reaping of those results. You had to live in a posture of forgiveness all your life as the Amish people to be able to forgive. And as a black Methodist AME African Methodist Episcopal Church live in that posture. Just as the workers, they, they don't spontaneously run to the fields and do it. It's a lot of planning, a lot of work, a lot of work on the machinery throughout. It's, it's their life, life, their heartbeat. And I wonder when Ecclesiastes wrote, there is a time to reap. If he wasn't reminding us that there are times in our life when we will reap what we have sown. And, uh, and as some of us begin to uh, age, there is a time when aging is a time of reaping, if you will. There's a time when uh, things come home to rest. I cannot have cream cheese every day of the week or it'll come home to rest. <laughs> but there are those uh, moments when we can look and enjoy the days we have. Because we have been blessed by how we have lived our lives in the way 
God has nurtured us to, to that process. There is something beautiful about those forgiveness stories. It isn't a denial of the tremendous heartbreak that they had. But there must be something about being able to lay your head down on the pillow at night and to say, I'm not filled with hate. I'm not filled with despair. I'm not filled with <coughs> anger. I'm filled with hurt, yes. But I'm also filled with love and forgiveness and grace. Which is a gift of God. When we commune at the table, it's a reminder that God has invited us in a special way through the body of Jesus Christ to be cleansed, to be renewed, to be refreshed for the continuing journey of our lives. Jesus says, take this bread. And maybe it was a different type of bread that we would take, but it was take this bread, for this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus didn't bake the bread or the pasta or the, you know, the particular type. Someone else did. He didn't go out the vineyards and take the grapes and pound them down, put them in the barrels or whatever make the juice or the grape. But God did. But Jesus harvested, didn't he? He harvested the bread and harvested the wine to become symbols of his life, his love, his grace, his peace. 